Aloha, everyone. Welcome to South Asian Dialogues, hosted by the Daniel K. Enoy Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies. I'm Saira Yamin. Joining me in today's discussion is Mr. Ahajan Akhtar, a prominent and very distinguished APCSS alumnus. Mr. Ahajan served the government of Pakistan in many prestigious positions in his decades of civil service. He retired as chairman, Port Qasim Authority under Ministry of Ports and Shipping in December 2017, having taken a number of outstanding industrial and commercial initiatives turning Port Qasim into Pakistan's premier port. Some of his earlier roles include as Secretary, Excise and Taxation Department, Provincial Government of Sindh, as Secretary, Agriculture, and as Commissioner Afghan Refugees in the Ministry of State and Frontier Regions, responsible for the census and repatriation of Afghan refugees, one of the largest refugee communities in the world. I'm also very pleased to have with us today in this dialogue, Dr. Hassan Abbas. He's a distinguished professor of international relations at the Near East South Asia Strategic Studies Center, also known as NISA, at the National Defense University in Washington, DC. He's both my co-host as NISA Center is our sister regional security studies center and also my guest and a very, very renowned Pakistani American scholar. So, so delighted to have you both today. The focus of our discussion is US-Pakistan relations. Mr. Ahajan, I would like to start by asking you to identify and com comment on Pakistan's top security concerns, both domestic and external. Thank you. Uh, let's start with the external first. Pakistan's top three external security concerns, top three, four, five, you can say is India, one, India, two, India, three, India, four. We look at all security concerns are directed towards our Eastern Front, which is India. Unfortunately, both India and Pakistan have not been, again, been able to come out of this phenomena of looking at each other as major threats. Our domestic concerns have been, I would say, the economy, the sectarian conflict that has started post 1979, Afghanistan and Iran changes, and poor governance and rapid change of political powers that come through elections. The, the focus of political party is still, most of them would like to resolve our issues with India. Unfortunately, the security state of Pakistan does not look in the similar fashion as the political parties do. Whenever there has been differences between the state security and the executive, civil political executive running the country, it's always been because of India. What and how they look at resolving these issues. This needs, uh, I would, I tend to, in my 35, 36 years of government service, civil service, I that the political parties of Pakistan do have the right concerns and they do feel that it should be resolved. Whereas the security apparatus in Pakistan vis-a-vis -vis the army looks at it completely differently. They don't seem to come eye to eye at all. And presently, we have a government which says and claims that they are on one page, which means every institution in Pakistan is on one page. But if you look at it domestically, people think it is the security apparatus in Pakistan which is making all the decisions. So, you know, it, despite the fact that uh, 
after so many years of ex in 70 plus years of our existence, we still not have been able to come to some agreement as to how to deal with our biggest neighbor on the right. As Mr. Hassan Abbas was saying, the feelings are similar on the other side of the border. You expect more seasoned response from India vis-a-vis -vis Pakistan after having 70 years of democracy. Unfortunately, that's not the case. They are our serious uh, senior partners in uh, discussions. They should be speaking from more experience and more maturity than Pakistan, because Pakistan has always had breaks where the military takes over and then you have the political parties in between. The power has always been shared over here where we do not have continuous democratic setup, unlike India. All these conflicts that we have domestic, they also arise mostly, I would say, from our main concern, which is India. <clears throat> the non-state actors that we see operating within Pakistan, mostly they are geared towards the Kashmir issue or the Indian issue. Since 79, the sectarian conflict that started in Pakistan, vis-a-vis, -vis, uh, it's whether it's uh, Iran-sponsored or Saudi-sponsored, that is a new equation that has come in and is uh, creating, uh, I would believe, I would say, a major unrest within the people of this country. We have approximately, I would say, 70-30 sectarian divide between the Sunnis and the Shias. 70 being the Sunnis, I would say, and 30% being Shias. So it's a very strong uh, uh, part of the population, which would have, I would say, pro-Iran leaning, one can say, because the Shia faith is uh, represented in Iran. Their fight that goes on in Pakistan is one of the major external security concern, which is domestic in, in this country. It supposedly, they say, it started from Jung, and it is built, to some extent, it's economics. But I would still think it's the the fight that's go that is going on vis-a-vis -vis Iran and Saudi Arabia played on our fields in which more than 75,000 people have, you know, overall in these uh, conflicts have died locally in this country. Thank you, Mr. Ahajan. Dr. Abbas, uh, as I was listening to uh, Mr. Ahajan, I was thinking about you. You are working, uh, you're affiliated with Harvard, you're doing a lot of work on Muslim geopolitics, you're the senior advisor on a project on Shiaism and global affairs at Harvard. And I'm very, very interested to hear your views in response to what we just heard. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to comment on two things. Um, again, many of these things um, are, are of course a matter of opinion and um, there's a lot of history and politics and culture, um, which, is, which is linked to these ideas. But, but very briefly, and this is more in um, terms of our question as well, or, or general thoughts. Uh, on, as regards um, India, as Mr. Um, Aga has mentioned, uh, indeed, um, since the last 70 years, that's how the whole narrative um, or ideology was framed anything that is Pakistan is um, anti-India, anything that is India is stands opposed to Pakistan. And I wonder at times um, whether that was the frame, how it had all begun um, with Jinnah, when uh, the, the famous statement, when he was asked, uh, this is one of the few speeches of Muhammad Ali Jinnah, the founding father of Pakistan, which are on record and recorded um, uh, when he was asked, uh, Mr. Jinnah, but this was by a British journalist, um, he was asked, Mr. Jinnah, if there's a war between China and India, uh, whose side you will be on? And Jinnah looked at him with surprise and said, of course, we will be with India fighting China um, because of the linguistic, political, religious, cultural uh, linkages. Um, there's far more when I 
again, I'm sure Mr. Aga has, and Sarah, you have also experienced when you're flying elsewhere, being from the region, I find if I see a person with a turban, a Sikh, I start talking to him in Punjabi, I feel far more um, at home with him than at times I was because of my linguistic, cultural notions with, with somebody else in from some a Baloch, for instance. Um, so my question also is, or my, I, I wonder and I continue to think, uh, what over a period of time, the last 70 years has gone and entrenched, and we know some of the issues, Kashmir and others, but still one would feel the things that bring the, the region in culturally closer are far more stronger than politics and some of the border issues. Um, and one feels whether um, the general view was, and I say this as of uh, ethnically Punjabi, uh, when, I used, was, when I was in Pakistan and I would mention these things, and my friends from Sindh and Balochistan and Pashtuns will say, well, these you Punjabis, because most of the military comes from Punjab, you guys are overwhelmed with India. Uh, the Punjabis and the Sindhis and the Baloch think differently. Um, and they may not have that kind of a break, inverted commas hatred like someone else. So th that was one thought I thought if you can share whether these things you think are normal or not. On, um, on the sectarian issues, I think that is, um, in my understanding, uh, one of the tragedies of the modern era in South Asia. Um, because in, historically, Pakistan and the culture of Islam in India um, was, was more uh, Persian, more Turkish, uh, more Central Asian. Uh, I'm thinking of this famous article from Saru Shirfani, who used to say, Pakistan has mistakenly started looking at, in, at um, Afghanistan at, as its strategic depth. Pakistan's strategic depth culturally was in Iran, that was the Persian, even today in Pakistan, as uh, both of you know better than me, if you want to know the um, cultural or scholarly credentials of somebody, you would see whether they speak Persian or not. So it was beyond Shiaism, the, the linkage, I think, was more cultural, more historical. But you're right, from the Afghanistan crisis and, um, and especially the, the Islamic revolution and the way the Iranian politics with Saudis and with the Arab and Gulfs developed, it became more sectarian. Um, I think historical, it was not. Um, someone can also argue that, um, uh, can, can very respectfully uh, differ with you on that. Um, the, the Iranians, uh, the, the Shias in Pakistan would argue that they, their leaning to Iran is a very problematic question because uh, there, is, there are more Shias, for instance, maybe in Iraq and the Arabs or elsewhere. Um, I remember this has become so political, and I'll close with that. Um, that as you have said, there are probably 70% Sunnis and 30% Shias. Um, uh, someone on the Sunni side, my friend would say, uh, no, the Shias are hardly 10%, maybe 15%, and the Shias blow it up just to see, project them as more so. Um, the Shia would say, no, that if you break the Sunnis into the Obandis and Barelvis, it becomes different. And that conversation is very problematic. Uh, I'm mentioning it as a, because this has taken sectarian uh, tone, which historically, apparently in Pakistan was never the case. Uh, mixed marriages were routine. It became so sectarian, the whole narrative, uh, whether the Pakistanis would say, uh, the Shias would say the Pakistanis have become more Saudi uh, or more Wahhabi because of, uh, uh, of the religious narrative. So the, the Iran-Saudi battle uh, and just handing over the religious debate, saying the Shias are with Iran, the Sunnis or Wahhabis are with Saudi Arabia, has been very damaging because Pakistani society and culture, to the best of my understanding, was far more richer and more mature uh, than to be identified with Taliban. Like most people will say, all Pashtuns are Taliban, or all because every Taliban is a Pashtun, uh, which is wrong. Um, <coughs> these, these brackets, uh, what do you think these putting these um, identities into these brackets of uh, Shia and Sunni has, be has become very problematic for Pakistani cohesion and for religious harmony. Uh, just, just my brief thoughts. I, know I was completely agree with Dr. Hassan Abbas. He's really pointed out very correctly. Unfortunately, if you look at this divide, when did it start? You trace it back to a non-political government. Uh, I mean, what I, what I mean is it started in Ziaul Haq's time. This entire uh, conflict within Pakistan, Sunni, Shia, this started during those, uh, those years when Ziaul Haq was running the country. And after that, unfortunately, it has got too 
involved within the security apparatus. I would say uh, this is there are on state actors uh, which are supported, which have strong extremist religious point of views. Uh, uh, to them, uh, Shia is uh, uh, a non believer. And in, in, in many cases, there are instances where they're just killed for no fault, just for being a Shia. Uh, you must have heard and on television must have seen uh, the Hazaras being identified because they're very distinct looking. And everybody knows that all Hazaras are Shias. So it was open season to kill Shias uh, and uh, sorry, Hazaras in Balochistan. And there were a few groups then the groups would be, you can count them in maybe a couple of hundreds. We who were responsible for all this, everybody knew that where they are and where they operate from, but nothing was done to stop this conflict because then they were used somewhere else. So this has created very strong uh, issues within the country. These are the strong, serious domestic issues, which Pakistan never had till 1977. Um, we had one early, earlier issue, the Ahmadi issue. Unfortunately, that also uh, started the whole thing, but it was still subsided. It wasn't, it wasn't to the extent that they just made them non-Muslims, but there, wasn't, there was not a season of killing going on uh, as it is now. It's, uh, you must, uh, there was an instance recently where a bank guard and a bank manager had a uh, an issue with each other. The bank managed, the guard shot the manager and came out and said that he was uh, basically an Ahmadi or a non believer, and he said something against Prophet Muhammad. And it has reached that stage where people would immediately believe the bank guard, and the poor bank manager who was shot dead couldn't even defend himself. So, this is the, the polarization that has occurred in Pakistan. And uh, we need to really, for this country to, uh, you know, put its uh, guards on and correct this issue. And our external issues definitely there, but these domestic concerns are very, very serious. Absolutely. And Thank you both for uh, sharing your uh, insights on some of the very, very complex domestic and external security concerns and considerations for Pakistan, the complexity of the relations with India, the complexity of uh, local, national, sectarian politics and the nexus with uh, the regional geopolitics, uh, the role of elites through Pakistan's history in perpetuating some of this sectarianism and certainly uh, the problem of polarization within society right now. It is really um, a matter of great concern. And this is just a tip of the iceberg that I think we are touching. But um, in the interest of, of time, let me move on to another very tough topic and, and an important one, which is US-Pakistan relations. Where do they stand today? Over to you, Mr. Arajan. Uh. Pakistan has always thought that U.S. had special relations with us and they were, we were the favored, uh, we would say, vis-a-vis -vis compared to India, with their relation with India. It's, uh, if you remember back in the days of Johnson, President Johnson, and uh, that identifies our relationship with, um, with America, there was a camel car driver called Bashir Ahmed and, and there was a lot of... Uh, uh, publicity in Pakistan and people were very excited that Johnson had a liking for that man. But when it came to uh, uh, the 65 war, it was Pakistan's spare parts and military supplies that were blocked. And they blocked with uh, India's also, but India arms uh, and ammunition didn't depend on American supplies. They were By that time, they were mostly Russian. So we were the ones that were hurt more than India. Pakistan has consistent, consistently stood by U.S. in most of the world issues. Unfortunately, uh, the, the reciprocation Pakistan feels is missing. 
what they what Pakistan fails to understand, U.S. has got many other concerns. We are, our main concern is India specific. U.S. has many other issues in which they would like to get involved in the area and the region. Uh, as far as our own, uh, how did we uh, come forward whenever U.S. has asked for assistance? Uh, the U-2 story is one issue, one where pa Pakistan uh, provided them the base. And if you look at the Afghan war, that's probably the only success the CIA and the U.S. has had in which they were able to defeat a superpower, Russia, you know, USSR at that time, without a single boot on ground. It had Pakistan not been there or had Pakistan not provided the assistance it did. It would have been probably another Bay of Pigs fiasco. The, the, the Mujahideen or the Taliban, whoever they were at that time, would have been wiped out and, and Afghanistan would have been a different story. So the only success that the U.S. has had in, in defeating Russia in such a big way has been because of Pakistan. After that, Pakistan has expected a similar support from U.S., very conveniently forgetting that our support that we expect from U.S. is only limited. U.S. and Pakistan, uh, I would say, coincide on an issue-to-issue -issue basis, our relationship. That's how the, uh, we should look at it. We do not see uh, some of the, obje the objectives of the India area, the Indo-Pacific, uh, the Quad, uh, Australia, U.S., China, Japan, uh, these are the India, spe specifically when India is involved in it, we do not see eye to eye at all. We differ and we feel that uh, the importance that the U.S. has started to give to India is at, the, at our cost. Even the nuclear uh, uh, deals that the U.S. has been signing allows India to move some of its nuclear material for military purposes as it is being supplied nuclear uh, uh, fusion materi uh, material for its uh, power projects and other uses. So, uh, and Pakistan still looks at China, which today uh, U.S. is trying to counter as its strongest ally in the area. One, one is... Um it, it's such a fascinating story, the Pakistan-U.S. relationship. The, it seems like a pendulum at times from one end, Pakistan seen as the most allied, ally of the U.S. at the forefront uh, uh, or as a frontline state, uh, whether it was the form, pushing back former Soviet Union or, or the Afghan Jihad or counterterrorism. And on the other side of the pendulum is the sanctions, the history of sanctions with Pakistan. It's, it has been constantly going from one side to the other. And now the China factor um, has come into play. Uh, historically, it would not have mattered. But now with the U.S.-China rivalry, it has made Pakistan in a difficult position. Uh, but um, and Pakistan uh, want to, to the best of my understanding, want to keep um, a strong relationship with Western capitals, and especially United States, because its military gets most of its equipment from United States. You cannot change your military equipment and your fighter aircraft just to Russian or to uh, French so the, the bonding, uh, so to say, between U.S. and Pakistan has very strong foundations. But when it comes to public perceptions, um, the, the, the feeling, critical feeling in Pakistan is, and that at times in U.S. side fails to understand, especially at the ordinary level, that it's uh, when Pakistanis complain, it is out of um, that association because the understanding of the idea of friendship is so different. Uh, whereas an ally is a different ball game, and being a friend is a different ball game, and and um, and th that that pushes the two sides um, in other directions. But still, there's so much to collaborate on. There's uh, so much to uh, connect the two sides, um, and, and I, I hope we hope that the the strengths of the relationship will ultimately win over the kind of the the negativities, complaints, and concerns on each side. Thank you. Thank you for that. And I agree that there's clearly a great, op there are many opportunities for uh, 
building the relationship anew, perhaps uh, in, in coming months, both Pakistan and the United States will reconsider. But I'm very uh, glad also that the mention of China has come up, which is a very, very close friend of Pakistan, as had been the United States for a very long time, uh, there, but very different relationship, as Hassan, you mentioned. It's a different view of the relationship, different uh, way of uh, relating to each other. Uh, so now, in this current era, as a U.S.-China strategic uh, competition is intensifying, what are the implications for South Asia's for South Asian security? What are the, what are the implications for geopolitics in the region, in particular, Mr. Ahajan? I would like to request your thoughts. Okay, uh, <clears throat> I think the closeness that uh, U.S. Uh, uh, seems to be. Uh, coming cl uh, close to India is concerned vis-a-vis -vis China and to make it the, the India as the uh, one country which will be there to checkmate China in the area. I don't think Pakistan would be agreeing to that concept at all. Uh, as I said earlier, the focus on Quad and the Indo-Pacific uh, area with India being the main player, one of the main players, uh, is something which is not digestible at all in our country and in the security apparatus in Pakistan will not accept it, neither will the political parties. And that and that place, I think both would agree. The, the, the amount of investment that China is placing in Pakistan, the amount of infrastructure investment that China has done in Pakistan is not comparable to that U.S. or any other European country uh, would be willing to do. Uh, the, the power projects, the dams being built, the road infrastructure, that comes in billions of billions of dollars. And unfortunately, uh, in Pakistan, we still have a feeling as of China as a strategic ally, the one that Mao Zedong and Chou Enlai, their strong memories and strong favoritism that both uh, these leaders had for Pakistan. What the Pakistan uh, has to understand is that generation is gone. The, the generation which is now making the decisions was probably not even born in 50s and 60s. So, and they, they, their approach is entirely business-like. They go wherever there is investment and returns to be made. They have no special liking for a particular country. Uh, if it suits China, if it is strategically uh, adds to well, add value to the Chinese perspective, they will go there and invest there and work there. Presently, then, um, if you look at the amount of, uh, the number of Chinese in Pakistan, I don't think there is any other nation which has put which has that many of its people ever in this country. Even at the peak, when the U.S. and Pakistani relationship were closest, I don't think the numbers would even come close. If you look at the Chinese working and living in Pakistan now, so the Chinese footprint is very, very big and very strong presently in Pakistan. Despite, I would say, not a rollback, but to some stage a slowdown of the CPEC project since 2018 after the change of the government. But it's the impact is so big that no country, no political party, no um, institution in Pakistan will be able to roll it back. Uh, there is no doubt that the power projects and the dams that are being built have strategic value for this country. And they, uh, you know, we, uh, we need to understand this, that we cannot forego all this just because some other Western country might invest. Because Till now, the investment, uh, despite U.S. being the biggest trading partner as far as Pakistani exports are concerned, the investments of the U.S. companies in Pakistan is very, very limited. Very briefly, I think Aga Saab is, is spot on and so his views are insightful. Again, uh, it's more of a, um, an open-ended question on my end, there's no doubt the Chinese investment in infrastructure, it's, it's a very smart move. I mean, that, that was a gap in the international arena. 
and uh, whether it's silk road or cpac the china pakistan economic corridor or the way they are building their network um, it it's it's um, it should not surprise anyone but that that's how the, the, the Ch- china has opted to expand its its influence also so um, develop the relationship however i continue to think the the dilemma in this regard for countries like pakistan and other countries as well for instance the pakistani political system is so western democratic oriented the institutions are all western language um, even an ordinary person a shopkeeper will be able to converse um, in english i go to iraq and iran and other countries and i often feel people can't speak in english whereas every pakistani irrespective of literacy level will be able to how many pakistanis can speak chinese are chinese learning english or urdu and so there is a long way to go uh, for those kind of connections to happen uh, so because, because of the links on education systems uh, rule of law systems uh, uh, criminal justice systems there there's much more um, linkage between the some of the western countries especially us and uk um, and and countries like pakistan so that also is is competing with the chinese effort i think to to have um, their influence and have their network strength and that that's i wanted to briefly add thank you what are some uh, opportunities for both the for both pakistan and the united states in particular for strengthening their relationship this is uh, a question for both of you uh, uh if i may start dr uh uh pakistan and us let's put it this way uh let's look at the afghanistan issue the differences arose when pakistan and Af- and us did not look at the afghan solution with the same eye prior to this from 79 till 89 90 when both had a similar viewpoint of what needs to be done everything worked out very well they were the best of allies everything worked well there is one thing when the interest can do not converge that's when the differences have started a major issue is has been afghanistan with the us and to some extent how we look at kashmir how pakistan looks at kashmir and how it should be resolved the issue of kashmir vis-a-vis india and how the us looks at it there is a difference of uh, opinion there and unfortunately pakistan is has been put on the spot uh, with fatf and other such uh, ways and means uh, to make them follow the same policy that the us wants like it to it's a little difficult for us to completely follow the path laid down by the us because we have our own interest we need to focus on them us can help pakistan as even president trump had said even though i think his days are numbered now that he would like to intervene and settle the kashmir issue that would be the most important thing for pakistan if us could play any role in that let's wait for the new presidency and see uh, whether the uh, the interest converge over the after after 20 january and the other ways that mr biden in his uh, statement prior to the elections had given pakistan would be very keen to know what how us would be looking at money laundering and some of the <clears throat> money that is stolen from pakistan and invested in us most of the corruption that happens um, high level corruption that happens in pakistan that money is stashed up mostly in the western countries it doesn't go to china nobody goes and buys an apartment in beijing it's either it's california canada or london mr biden has promised that he would be looking at it more sternly and help third world countries and uh wherever these issues are, are where money is 
stolen, invested. You must be familiar with Papa John. So that kind of investment is something which we would like that does not happen from our aid money being pilfered or uh, otherwise. This is uh, this kind of uh, equation would be would definitely strengthen the relationship. Uh, uh, otherwise, as I said earlier, India and Kashmir are the opportunities where, if that can be resolved, will be the will definitely strengthen U.S.-Pakistan interest. These are excellent suggestions, um, Agasab. I think, as far as Kashmir is concerned. My own opinion is that the United States would like to, and it has tried several times, even if we, uh, I think uh, President Trump, as you said, he was very interested. President Obama was interested. Others have also been interested, but there's always pushback from India. And because India has become so important, it's become such an, you know, it's such a strong economy. It's a rising world power uh, that its own interests uh, Trump, Pakistan. So I sometimes think uh, it'll be very difficult for Pakistan to make the case uh, for a country like the United States or even another to elevate this issue at an international level. What are your thoughts about this, Hassan, since you're here? Certainly. Um, Mr. Agha has made my job much easier. I mean, he has been... He, Always, he was speaking first, so it is more difficult uh, and it's easier for me because then I can borrow some of his ideas and, and, and respond. So, so thank you, sir, for uh, taking the difficult task. Um, a couple of points, and then I'll, uh, which are linked to Saira, uh, uh, Dr. Saira, you're, what you're mentioning. Um, on Kashmir, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, uh, the international politics today is such that U.S. can facilitate um, um, if, if there's willingness in both India and Pakistan. And that, that's the way um, uh, things have moved in international aid um, without India and Pakistan coming to terms with each other um, bilaterally in some arrangement. The, the West and the United Nations, everyone else can pitch in. Uh, but first and foremost, no one can force India or even Pakistan. Um, look at the case of Afghanistan. Uh, United States really wanted a different outcome in the last 15 years, uh, but Pakistan's relationship with Taliban was strong for its own reasons. Um, and U.S. couldn't, despite aid, despite uh, uh, collaboration on counterterrorism, Pakistan, uh, Pakistan could not be moved away from the way Pakistan viewed Afghanistan. So, so the U.S. had its limitations when it came to Pakistan, trying to change Pakistan's uh, policy in Afghanistan. Same, U.S. Uh, cannot change the Indian policy unless India and Pakistan come together. This is um, uh, the reality um, uh, in, in some ways um, which we are faced with. Um, on corruption also, and that I, if I for a moment um, wear my hat as a, as a former law enforcement officer in Pakistan and as in my what I teach on policing and law enforcement, you're absolutely right. This is at an international level. There has to be far more coordination and cooperation to go against these safe heavens where people get their money the way they take corruption money and go anywhere in the world and, and use that. I think you're absolutely right. But the main requirement would be in those cases that a corruption case, because corruption f first and foremost happens in Pakistan, in a kickback, in a money laundering, and then they take the money out. If the case is proved in a criminal justice system, in a court system in Pakistan, which is credible, then that case will allow um, any international uh, power or any country to say, okay, this corrupt money is in our country. But first and foremost, if there's a credible legal system uh, process or due process, which proves a corruption case, that's why Pakistan's own um, anti-corruption regime has to be far more stronger uh, for them to make those cases. Um, and last but not the least, I think the real opportunity between US and Pakistan is going to be in the education arena. And the Fulbright scholarships, I think, are the most important feature. I say this as a teacher as well. Um, that's where uh, the, the real strength is. In this age of artificial intelligence um, and 5G worldview, and, um, and look at the Googles, the Apple, the Tesla, uh, the, the edge that US has is through its um, companies uh, in California, but also through its educational system, which provide that. And Fulbright scholarships allow the young, bright, talented Pakistanis to come 
And I'm so glad that that avenue is and channel is still open. Any more push towards that will strengthen Pakistan's education system and, and their capacity. And that I think should be the avenue um, Pakistan should be looking at. And US, I hope, will, will continue investing in Pakistani education. Thank you. Just, just to add one more, uh, uh, Mr. Abbas is very correct. Uh, if you remember, the Karachi IBA uh, uh, Institute was set up by the U.S. It was University mm -hmm. of Southern California and Wharton School of Business, which set up that institute. And it has pr produced outstanding uh, graduates, which have done a lot all over the world. So the education is where, yes, definitely, I agree, Mr. Dr. Hassan Abbas has put the point correctly. Well, that's very interesting. I didn't know that IBA was a product of United States assistance to Pakistan. It's a very, very prestigious uh, institution and certainly produces some really, really good graduates that we are very proud of. So uh, both of you have raised some very excellent points. And, and I'm so glad that Hassan uh, talked about education in particular, because in addition to helping empower Pakistanis, it also gives the opportunity for the United States to engage with Pakistani civil society. And which is very important. Otherwise, you know, as far as it's, as long as it's um, focus remains on engaging with the military and less so with the Pakistani civil society, it's very, very difficult to change the perceptions of Pakistan, Pakistanis. And I believe the Fulbright scholarship program that you mentioned Hassan, I believe Pakistan has been the largest recipient of this uh, support. So it's very, very generous on, on the part of the United States. So that's wonderful. So now I'm coming um, to the end of this discussion. And I have one more question for both of you. We had elections a few days ago in the United States. And uh, we are going to have a new administration in Washington, D.C. in a couple of months. What are your recommendations? both for the United States government, the incoming government, and for the Pakistani government. How to seize the moment? There's an opportunity for re-engaging and maybe revisiting the relationship. Please share your recommendations. I would like to, Dr. Sanabas to go first this time. So okay, I can... that's fair. That's fair. <laughs> that's absolutely legitimate. Um, I'll selfishly one pitch my uh, report that came out two days ago. It's called uh, U.S. Um, uh, Policy Towards South Asia Ideas um, uh, and Recommendations for the, uh, for the New Administration. So I've dealt with it in detail. If I had to pick one or two um, um, themes out of that, one is um, that for, for United States um, on our side, we'll have to think more about um, and international perspective that looks beyond borders and uh, look focus on issues beyond um, rivalries as real as they may be. Um, there are so many countries which this is not the Cold War era. It's, it's, it, it has to be cooperation uh, uh, rather than competition. And um, we hope that in the, the, the next U.S. administration uh, will we'll rethink its own policies as well, but build upon the strengths of these relationships with countries like Pakistan, and this is in the bracket, there are many other countries as well in the region where uh, the, the strengths can be built upon. And, um, and U.S. has um, an institutional makeup where, um, where the major policies, um, the direction of those policies remain the same. So I'm not expecting a major shift in the pol U.S. policy direction, but there's always um, more interest in what Dr. Sahar has so rightly pointed out um, in empowering um, the civil societies, in uh, building people-to-people -people relationship, um, in, in empowering institutions um, that build societies, such as criminal justice system. It's, uh, for counterterrorism, its uh, militaries play a very important role everywhere. It is the civilian law enforcement which provides, which would do crime fighting to push back organized crime. It is civilian law enforcement uh, and, uh, and, uh, and legal systems which strengthen and provide stability. So th those can be the, I argue, should be the areas uh, which, which should be the new channels of cooperation uh, in these countries. For Pakistan, um, Pakistan is an old relationship, um, whether it is 
the, the Biden administration or with the previous Trump administration, they are, are good at building relationships with U.S. And uh, the Pakistanis would have to think about um, not getting into, again, the, the same uh, issue of whether it is on China leaning or U.S. leaning. It, it has to be on certain areas where the strengths are with U.S., um, go for that. No one is expecting the Pakistan would say no to uh, infrastructure support from, from China that would, because that makes a lot of sense for Pakistan. And neither anyone, and I think to the best of my understanding in U.S., expecting that Pakistan should push back China, they are the neighbors. Um, uh, so it will have to be a more nuanced, not um, uh, a kind of this or that option. It has to be a combination of, of what is best um, for, for cooperation. That, that's the general framework um, that I think would be useful for both Pakistan and United States. One of cooperation, not necessarily competition or rivalry. Excellent, um, Dr. Abbas. I really appreciate your emphasis on cooperation and thank you for referencing your report, uh, which I avidly read. It was uh, published very recently, November 9th by the Center for Global Policy which is based in Washington, D.C. It's titled U.S. Policy Towards South Asia, Ideas and Choices for the Next Administration. Very timely. Uh, so thank you for that. Uh, over to you, Mr. Ahajan. Um, I would revert back to Vice President Biden's uh, policy statement that he gave, that if he becomes the president, these are the changes he's looking towards. Uh, one was obviously China, where he would like to get uh, there's not going to be much of a difference between the Trump approach and Biden approach, maybe. But overall, he would like to strategically deal with them with some of the issues that they have differences, especially business. Uh, but Iran, he's mentioned Iran as trying to get in Iran back into that agreement. And the U.S. would go back to the agreement that they had signed earlier for the nuclear arms and uh, inspections that were supposed to go on. Once Iran is out of that list, Pakistan looks at regional trade very, it's very important for us. We already have completely closed down our regional trade with India. Our biggest partner next door is Iran, which we have not dealing much with at all. Iran is a major rice buyer in the world. Pakistan exports rice. We are looking at a $5 billion target in the next three years. These issues, um, settling Iran down would help Pakistan in trade negotiations with Iran and also involved Iran in the Balochistan issue. I feel that linking Iran uh, uh, with trade, but obviously also the relationship will become stronger than what it is now. We can resolve some of our major security issues which emanate from Iran in Balochistan. Uh, we're looking forward to the change in the government. I would say Pakistan looks at it that um, the resolution of the Awan crisis, uh, the withdrawal of the U.S. troops, uh, changeover maybe in Afghanistan, which is something which matches what Pakistan's vision is of, uh, in uh, Afghanistan, which is also, I would say, uh, where India has a limited role. That's what Pakistan looks at in Afghanistan. Uh, strategically, I'm not saying that Afghanistan, the interest with India have to be as per Pakistan's in interest, but strategically, they, the India should have a limited role in surrounding Pakistan from the other side. That's what Pakistan is looking at. And hopefully, uh, in the next government, we would have these issues resolved. Mr. Ahajan, after, thank you so much for your very thoughtful recommendations and for joining us today in this conversation. I'm equally grateful to Dr. Hassan Abbas, to both of you for your time.